Yeah, that sucks. Okay. Um, so we missed the first part of the screen recording. That's fine. Uh, what I'm talking about here is expressions and that the computer needs to follow some rules for evaluating an expression such as a equals 4 plus 5. And what I can do is I can go to Google and I can type C++ and the term I am looking for is, and let me put this in a comment, uh, to evaluate expressions C++ and C uses operator precedence. And that is something that you all know fairly intuitively. So let me give you a different example before I go back to the web page. If I create an integer b and I say that b is equal to 4 plus 5 times 6, the answer is, what do we all know the answer to be? 34, right. Why is it not 9 times 6? Because we know that multiplication has to happen before addition, yes? And what if we want to change that? Parentheses, then we can do something like this. Yeah? Okay. This is oper These are operators. This is the addition operator. This is the multiplication operator. This is the assignment operator. Okay? As far as the language is concerned, they're all just operators, and it needs to follow rules of operator precedence to know what to do. So I go ahead and I just type in operator precedence, click on this to see what we see. Uh, the way to read this is these are the actual operators. There are quite a few here that we're unfamiliar with, but I'll point out the interesting ones. Let me make this a bit bigger. Uh, precedence is read, higher precedence is higher on this list. So, based on what we know and love about addition and multiplication, we expect to see multiplication higher than addition on this operator precedence chart. And sure enough, if I scroll down, don't get confused by this. Read what it says here. Uh, we'll find a little bit later on that the language is infuriating and that they use the same symbol for more than one thing. So, this doesn't say anything like multiplication, so that is not what we think it is. So, I keep scrolling. Keep scrolling, got some funky ones here. I uh, probably don't see that and probably don't even see that in 3.11. Let me see. Here we go. Multiplication, division, and remainder. Uh, so there it is, multiplication and division. Now let me ask a, a different question. If I have 5 plus, excuse me, um, uh, 10 divided by 5 times, divided by 5 times 3, what is that equal to? So when division and multiplication have the same precedence, how do you know which one to do first? Left to right. Yeah. So we come back here. Here's multiplication and division. Left to right. You'll note that there are a few wacky ones that go from right to left. Okay, so uh, again, the computer's fairly stupid, and so this is saying internally what the, the language needs to rely on to figure out what happens first. So, uh, if I go a bit further, here's addition and subtraction. So we do see that multiplication and division is higher in the precedence than addition and subtraction. This... I need you to get out of your head that there's something special about that equal sign. As far as the language is concerned, this is just yet another operator. What it does is it takes whatever's on the right side and it pushes it into whatever's on the left side, right? But it is, as far as the computer is concerned, it's just another operator and it needs to figure out when to do it. And so if I scroll down here a ways, here it is right here, direct assignment, way down on the list, pretty, pretty low. In fact, only our good friend the comma is lower. Um, so that is how expressions are evaluated, the order of them. Uh, now I made a, I started out by saying that the stuff predominantly, not entirely, but predominantly what your code is composed of are expressions that end with a semicolon making them a statement. Any expression is going to be fine. So let me give you 
Actually, let me stick with this one right here. Uh, we're happy with creating an integer. Here's so here's one of the exceptions. I wouldn't call that an expression. I would call this a declaration. I'm bringing into existence something. I would say this isn't an expression. It is an uh, declaration. All right. But by and large, our code is made up of expressions turned into statements by putting semicolons on them. Uh, so a equals 4 plus 5. We're happy with that expression. This is another declaration. Here's another expression, or a statement, uh, but an expression with a semicolon. This is an expression. I wonder if it works. Let's see if, if it throws up on line 11 when I try to compile it. What did I call this? G++ expressions. Hang on, I need to change my prompt again. There. Just is too far to the, the right otherwise. Uh, G expressions.cpp. It does give me a warning. Uh, but even though it gave me a warning, the warning is that it's unused. However, it is just a warning, kind of like the yield sign, right? So it does actually create an executable, and I can run it. It doesn't. I don't have any input or output in my program, so nothing happens. But I just want to show you that even though the compiler is warning me, and in fact, I'm not even sure it's possible if you compile in Jaguar, it won't even give you a warning. Uh, it depends on the version of G++ you're using. Some compilers won't give you any warning at all. So that's perfectly legal in the language. The reason it's giving me a warning is it's saying, hey, uh, do you really think you're doing something useful? Because you aren't doing something useful. Are you sure you meant to do that? I think you might be making a mistake. That's what the compiler is telling me by the warning. Uh, but in this case, I'm showing off and I'm not making a mistake. There's another valid expression. Okay, That'll work as well. We'll use a different number, 99. Let's try compiling it. It does give me the warning again. Just avert your eyes, don't look at the warning. It does work. My a dot out is still there. All right. And then I finished by giving you a warning about the if statements. Anyone recall what the warning was? All, always use it or never use it? Something equals something else. See out pi, right? This is kind of like an if statement, and a lot of people are going to tack that on. Yes, remember this? I did right at the end, and most people are already Facebooking and or whatever it is you young kids do. Um, so to our eyes, this is an if statement that's only going to print out high if something equals something else. However, as far as the compiler is concerned, that is how the compiler sees it. C out high is just a statement it's going to do 100% of the time. And if this happens to be true, then it's going to do absolutely nothing. This is kind of the null expression, perfectly legal. Uh, and it's infuriating because there's, there's no warning, I don't think, unless this version of the compiler is going to give me a warning. No, it doesn't give me a warning. Oh, what's this up here? Maybe it does. Oh, no, no, no. This is an error because I never created those as variables. All right. But yeah, so you're going to write it like this, and it's going to be a horrible bug that's hard to find. All right, so no semicolon there. Uh, so if these are if these are valid expressions, what precisely is happening on line 10? And the way I would describe line 10 is what the compiler does is it tries to evaluate the expression until there's nothing else to evaluate, and once there's nothing else to evaluate, then it moves to the next line of code. So uh, what it would do if I was to look inside at the order of operations, first it would look at all of its operators. It would decide the multiplication is going to happen first, and it would be something like this. And then it would do the next thing, and then it would do the last thing, and then it would move on. What it does is it crunches that expression. It evaluates each of those operators until there's nothing more to evaluate. And once there's nothing more to evaluate, then it moves to the next line of code. 
Okay. All right. Uh, so let me talk then a little bit about some of the funkiness that can happen with if statements. Uh, we are familiar with this assignment operator. However, I've used this, but I don't believe I've talked about it at all, two equal signs. So if I come here, the single equal sign is a direct assignment, basically assigning, note the order of evaluation of the equal sign, right to left. Let me actually stay on that for a minute and show you some interesting things since it is a language that just evaluates expressions. I'll just comment that out to get it out of the way. I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to create a bunch of variables. I'm going to create a variable uh, w, x, y, and z, a bunch of integers. Okay. I want to make all of those integers equal to 42. So I can do this. w equals 42, and I can use my effective use of them. And I can do that, right? What if I do this? What? So they're all obviously of equal precedence since they're all the exact same operator, but they evaluate in which direction? So that means if I was to write parentheses for how it's actually evaluated, it would be doing this first, then it would be doing this, right, and so on like that to get from right to left. So what happens then is the 42 is actually assigned to Z. And then it gets to this much of it. And now we know, you and I know, it's our little secret that Z has 42. So now that 42 <coughs> is going to be assigned to Y. And then that's all that's left. And then that 42 and Y is going to be assigned to X. And that's all that's left. And then that 42 and X is going to be assigned to W. And now W has 42. There's no more work to be done. It'll now go to the next line of code. Okay. So there's this other operator here which is uh, it's calling it a relational equal and, and then there's its cousin here uh, bang equal sign which is does not equal respectively so uh, the the way I phrase this is comparison for equality finding out if two things are the same and this is to find out whether two things are different so what I can do Uh, I guess I should compile this to like to show you that it works. Let me see if I have any other bad code in there. I'll get my warnings on line <coughs> seven and or no, those aren't warnings. So that'll be fine. So I should see all this code work correctly, and yeah, no errors at all. The reason I'm not getting the warnings anymore, I just commented that these this code out. That's the only reason we're not seeing that. Okay, so that's perfectly legal. It actually is done. Uh, you will see it in production code. What happens a lot, uh, a nasty little bug, is that I will say that um, w is equal to 42. I'm going to say that uh, b, well, what it, we already know what b is. So we know that w, let me make a comment. w is now 42 and b is 34, yes? So let me say w equals w is equal to is equal to x, excuse me, b equals b end line. Alright, so I'm going to print out w equals whatever's in w. I'll say that it's equal to b, which is equal to whatever's in b. So that's what I'm comparing to see if w is equal to b. Uh, and it's giving me a warning. Oop. What am I doing wrong here? Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. 
So it says they're equal, but you all are saying, wait a minute, W is not equal to 34. W has to be equal to 42. Well, let's put a little, let's test that. W is equal to, I must be going insane. What is W equal to? Let's see what it is. So here I should be, if Todd's right, this 42 should be going to Z to Y to X to W, and I should see 42 here. W is equal to 42, but now W is equal to 34, right? What's going on with this? And this is what that common error is. What this is, is this is a perfectly legal expression in the language, which is to assign B to W. Yes? So, again, if I was to chain these, after it does that, it's just going to be W, which is going to be 34. Now the question is, is 34 true or false? It's true because what in the language is false? Zero, Zero and anything else is true, right? So when you write this, what you really want is that, probably. Okay, so that's a gotcha. I can see this compiler is nicely giving me warnings. Uh, not all compilers will, um, but it's saying using the result of an assignment as a condition without parentheses, so it's telling me how I can suppress it, uh, and it's saying probably what you wanted here are two equal signs. So this compiler is actually being very helpful. Uh, this is a recent addition to this compiler. I think as recently as last semester I wasn't getting these warnings, so uh, it's nice to see this compiler is finally giving them. All right. Uh, the next thing I, I want to mention, which I didn't talk about on a, a different subject, <coughs> is strings. And assignment three, you have to deal with uh, the direction and the color, the direction the car is going and the color of a street light. Yeah. And I'm gonna copy. I'm gonna um, let's call this uh, strings.cpp. If you a string is not a built-in type, it's not like an integer or a float. I think I may have said this. You have to include string. And then to create one of these, just like I say integer x, I can say string s or string x. And then to assign strings to it, uh, the, the main takeaway from line 9 is that you have to use double quotes to surround the text that you want to assign to x. And otherwise, uh, it, the string can be used fairly intuitively. So I can say if x equals Todd, see out, I don't know his name. And it obviously is not equal to Todd, it's equal to something here, so I should see nothing printing out if I run this code. Let's try that, g++ strings, a dot out, Oh, what's going on here? Oh, all right, all right. I'm, I'm printing something at something here, here. Bad choice of bad choice of words. So I'm seeing this output, but I'm not seeing this output because it's not equal to Todd, and that's in evidence right there. Uh, let me go ahead and change this here to Todd, just to confirm. And there, I see that printout. So the use of strings is fairly intuitive. All right. Now, the, the last thing I want to mention on this subject and on assignment three is a, a confusion that uh, several people get every semester. So I'm going to throw this out as a, a frequently occurring problem. Let's say that I, and let me change the, the context from strings back to integers. Uh, let's say that I want to write a program uh, try nums.cpp. I'm going to get rid of the string. All right. 
I'm going to create an integer x. And I'm going to ask the user, how old are you? And I'm going to read that into this variable. In fact, let me make it more meaningful. Let me call it age. But now I want to do if, how about if they're uh, 21, I want to say, you are, I don't know, what, what should you do? If you're, you're allowed to drink. Uh, what a lot of people, and then I say if you're 22, then you're allowed to buy a house. And if you're 23, you're allowed to buy a red ball. And if you're 24, you write, depending on what age you put in, I'm going to print out a different message. Here is the mistake that many people make. And then I don't know what goes on here, but they end up getting to the if statement part. If 24, maybe they do something like this. If 24 is equal to age, or age is equal to 24, right? And it gets really confusing. And what's happening is uh, people are getting confused between what a variable is and what the contents of a variable are. So if I bring this back to assignment three, which is the direction the car is going and the color of the street light, then what I see a lot of is this. String red, string green, string straight. Does anyone see how this doesn't work? Okay. How many strings do you need in assignment three? Two. Just make two strings. Call one direction, call the other color, right? And then uh, if you want to do comparisons against red, green, and straight, your comparisons are against these as something in double quotes. So you say if color equals red, all right? So I just want to throw that out there as something to, to avoid doing in assignment three. Now what I'd like to do is uh, take any questions in the envelope. So if everyone could throw those up front here. See, I want to start out by saying the answer is because if you're like 70 years old or older, that's hilarious <laughs> for those who grew up with Johnny Carson. Did I, uh, by the way, mention that I do do children's parties? <laughs> if you have some kids that want to learn a little C++, I won't put a clown nose on, but I will, uh, I will bring balloons. All right. Uh, what effect does having these useless expressions have on a program? Like when you put line 15 at, as 99 semicolon. Uh, the effect is it has absolutely no effect. What happens is when the program is being evaluated and you hit something like this line here on 31, assume it's not commented out, then the the language says, okay, what do I need to evaluate here? I don't need to evaluate anything. I'm just going to move on. Um, 
you actually, uh, I don't want to talk about functions, so I'm going to uh, defer further discussion of that for the moment. But yes, it, it does no harm, but it does no good as well. It does nothing, absolutely nothing. Does it slow it down at all? I mean, is it yeah, it's a, it's a good question about if it slows it down. Um, the, the practical answer is no. So one of the things that happens when your program compiles is the compiler does something called optimizations, which means it'll find things that it's able to determine while the program is compiling and will, for lack of a better term, hard code it. And what it'll see is it'll see that's a useless expression, and it will decide not to generate any additional work for the processor. It, so it'll, it'll basically ignore it and move on. Uh, another example, a more meaty example of what I'm talking about is if I say if uh, 3 equals 3, C out, hi, uh, it will know that this is going to be true 100% of the time. So it will not create some sort of check for equality in the code, it'll actually just put this one line in there, right? And so this is, again, a feature of, of the compiler's optimizer. Okay, uh, several questions here. Should I write pound include IO stream before any program that I start? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So whenever I brought up code, I end up starting with this as kind of a shell, and this is always at the top. Uh, one of the things that I've said a few times is before you are allowed to use it, you have to tell the compiler what it is. Now, there are certain things that you don't. For instance, if I create an integer b, uh, there are some things that are intrinsically known by the language. One is integers, floats, things like that the compiler knows. However, any input and output, C in, C out, uh, those things you are unable to use. Let me get actually get rid of that. Let me say, first let me show that it works without it. G++ code.cpp. Oops. Yes, okay, let me comment that out. It's just so stop it from yammering at me. All right, so that compiles just fine. Um, however, if I try to say C out, hi. Okay, use of undeclared identifier C out. So this is an instance of before you're allowed to use it, you have to tell the compiler what it is. That's why I have to do the pound include IO stream. This is basically saying that I want to have the ability to use all things input and output uh, related to C++. Is it required? Only if you are running a program that has input and output. And there are plenty of, of programs you can write that don't. So let me give you an example. Um, you all have used a web browser. Uh, what's happening is when you go browse a website, there's actually a program running to, that's waiting for you, and, and you send in your URL, and it pulls it apart, and it gives you back a web page. It's giving you back text. That is actually not being input or output to the screen. So that program, and it's a big program, doesn't require input and output to the screen. It's, it doesn't use C in or C out, so it may not necessarily have I.O. stream included. Okay, so there are there are real large applications that you can create that don't require I/O stream. Main is uh, main is open to any new file but it doesn't work if I type it before int main. Should I type it? Uh, I'm not sure the meaning of this. Um, I will make a, so I'm not entirely sure of the question. I'll make a couple comments about it. Uh, I said before that the one thing that all applications have in common is a main function because it is the mechanism through which the machine knows where your program should start. You can have a program, and there are actual programs out there that are comprised of hun literally hundreds of CPP files. 
So we're only dealing with simple one uh, single CPP files. This is code.cpp. Uh, any application that you're running, Microsoft Word, web browsers, all those have dozens, hundreds, even thousands of CPP files associated with them. There has to be a main function somewhere in there or uh, the program doesn't know where to begin. If I take this out, and I can take this out, um, a good way of taking it out is to make it a typo. Now I do not have a main function. What will happen if I try to compile the main function? Oops, I've got my C out issues here. Okay, this is uh, probably this is the keyword undefined. It's saying, "Hey, you're asking me to compile and create a program, but you haven't, you don't have a main anywhere." And as a result, it's unable to create a program. Um, so I would say that for a running application, main is required. As far as where you have it in the, in the file, again, you can have thousands of files, so main can essentially be anywhere you want it to be. It just has to be somewhere in your application that you're compiling. Uh, we will see more. We're going to be getting into multiple files just a little bit further on. Uh, we're actually going to be, do a little bit of it in assignment four as kind of a, a cookbook approach and then uh, work with multiple files in more detail later in the semester. So we'll start to see the effect of having multiple files and where it is you place main. Uh, how to use, uh, so here's some uh, basic foundational questions. How to use if else in C++ and what is G++? G++, let me start with G++. G++ is merely the mechanism for converting what we see as human readable into something that's machine readable. That's all it is. You will spend your, assuming you're a computer scientist here, you're going to spend uh, much of your time learning different programming languages. And those different programming languages are different ways of telling the computer what to do, and they all have their own compilers, meaning that um, trying to think if I have a good example I can draw on. Let's see. This is a different programming language. And my text is too big so it looks really horrible. Uh, no, the, uh, for example, you see this word. This is, in this programming language, you say print to spit something out to the screen, whereas in C++ we say C out. So each programming language has its totally unique way of describing how to do things, and each compiler is going to be able to translate that to something the machine can, can read. So that's all G++ is, is it's how we convert code that looks like C++ code into something the machine can read. Uh, I'm going to table how to use if else for the moment. Um, why should we use return zero in the end? I think that's a, an excellent question. I've never talked about that. So that's what this is here, int. This is just saying when the function's done, what is it going to give back? And in this case, it's giving back a zero. Uh, you can do it for other functions. I think I've done a version of this. And we haven't talked about functions yet, but I can say return j plus k. And so j plus k is going to be an integer, so I, that's what I'm describing, what is returned. Um, so main returns an integer, and it returns a zero. But the interesting question is, where does main return it to? So main returns that number when it ends. When main ends, what happens? The program ends, and where do we end up? Back at the shell prompt, right? Okay. Uh, just if you take it on faith, what I can do is I can type this. A dollar sign echo means just to spit out. Dollar sign question mark. This tells me what number the last program I ran gave me. It gave me a zero. Can we play with that? Let's try 99. Compile it, run it, echo, dollar question mark. Okay. Now, every program that you're ever typing, what's something that you all type? LS? Yes? LS. Echo, dollar question mark. LS gave me back a zero when it was done running. LS has a main, 
At the very bottom, it probably said return zero. Would ls return something else? Yeah. What if I say ls and I ask it to list a file that doesn't exist? That's an error to ls, yes? Let's see. Oh, ls gave me a 1. So one of the interesting things, it's just a convention, is that whenever a program works correctly, give a 0 back. Whenever something goes wrong, return a non-zero back. And then when you're sitting here, you can interrogate that number to find out whether this program worked correctly or not. Um, okay, I'll table the rest of those for now. How do you um, how do you input multiple conditions into an if statement? Yeah, uh, so very quickly. So I can say something like if w equals 42 and x equals 99 or uh, z equals 56 and a does not equal 3. Okay, that's how you combine these things. The question is, what is the order of evaluation? What happens first? How many, op how many operators do I have in there? Let's list them out. That's one of them. What other operators do I have? Or. And what other one? Or. or does not equal. Right? Those are all of them. So what we have to do is we have to go back here and we have to find out the order that they occur. So e uh, let's look at equal equal. That's number nine. So I'm going to put a number next to each of these. That's nine on the precedence table. And is 13. Or is 14, and does not equal is, is 9. Okay. So the equal and the does not equal are going to happen first. So what's going to happen is this is going to be if, that's going to be either, um, let's just say for the sake of argument that that's true. I don't know whether it really is. It'll evaluate that first. And also, do these go left to right or right to left? We should check left to right. Okay. So I just follow the, just like if it was a bunch of, just like all you're doing is saying 5 plus 4 times 3 plus 7 times 8 plus 9, right? You just go left to right. As soon as you see the times, you do it. As soon as you see the times, you do it. Then you come all the way back and do the additions. Yes? Exact same thing. So we, uh, the equal and the does not equal happen first. So let's just go left to right and do them. That's going to be true or false. And that's going to be true or false. Let's just say it's true. That isn't evaluated yet. This is going to be true or false. I'm just going to put true for every one. That isn't evaluated yet. This is going to be true or false. Okay. Now you go, you do a whole nother pass. So after nine is the ands. The ands happen next. So that means that true and true have to be evaluated. That would be true. This isn't evaluated yet. True and true is evaluated. We'll say that's true. And then finally, we do the last one, true or true. If one of those is true, then they're both true. So the final evaluation is true. So now, finally, the if can decide whether or not to do what comes after it. And if true, it will go ahead and, and do whatever C out or whatever code you have here. Okay. Uh, same question. When will we begin our first project? Uh, I need to look at a calendar. I want to say two to three weeks from now. Yes. Say that again. Oh, the magic word. I haven't even put that up yet. I should. There, isn't there a quiz for Friday? Yeah. 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 yeah let's take another take another look. So I don't have uh, today's up. I'll get it up immediately after class. It'll just take five minutes. All right. Today's magic word, or secret word if you prefer, is, um, huh? 
Uh, no, nah, I want something kind of Cody. Uh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking uh, operator. All right, there we go. The word is operator. As in operator precedence. All right. And I have one last question, which is on Vim. Uh, I will work with Vim next time. So we're pretty much at the end. So I'll just uh, stop unless there are any last minute questions. All right.